All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to the uh, Evelyn Playhouse Public Domain Players reading of Andre, uh, written in 1798 by uh, William Dunlap. Uh, this is a play that uh, concerns the Major John Andre, who uh, was a, a figure of local historical importance. And the play actually takes place in Japan, New York. My name is Derek Parson. I am the uh, director and the founder of the uh, uh, Public Domain Players, which is a division of Elmwood Playhouse. I'd like to thank uh, Elmwood Playhouse. And if you want to find out more about Elmwood Playhouse, you can look at elmwoodplayhouse.com. And this uh, reading is free, and we hope to continue to, to do free readings. But to help maintain that, um, if you can, please go onto the website, not now, after the show, uh, to elmwoodplayhouse.com slash donate. And I also would like to uh, acknowledge the assistance of the Rockland County Historical Society in uh, promoting this, uh, in promoting this um, event, and also to the Orangetown um, Historical Museum and Archives and uh, Mary Cardenas of that organization will be here to uh, help with a uh, Q&A after the show. It's only a 90 minute show. So um, before we start, I would just like to uh, give you a little bit of background for certain uh, allusions that are made during the play, um, which would have been well known to the audience in 1798, but not so well known now. This is the kind of thing that ordinarily would be put in a note in the playbill, but unfortunately during the pandemic, we don't have playbills. So um, I just have to, to, to give it to you uh, orally. Um, so first of all, about uh, the uh, Major John Andre, he was a British officer and the head of the Secret Service. And he was communicating with Benedict Arnold, who was um, upset about uh, having been passed over and also was in great debt. Um, and uh, he uh, was arranging with Arnold. Arnold was the commander of West Point, and Arnold was going to surrender West Point for 20,000 pounds, which was a substantial sum at that time. Um, and that would have allowed the British to cut off New England from the rest of the colonies. Uh, so on um, September 20th, 1780, uh, Andre took the sloop called the Vulture. Um, two American privates saw the sloop uh, and bombarded, them, bombarded it with musket and rifle fire. That was not sufficient, so they paused and, to secure more aid. And while that pause was happening, uh, Arnold sent a boat to uh, escort uh, John Andre from the sloop to the shore. And they met in uh, the woods below Stony Point, right here in Rockland County, um, met until dawn, and then finally rode several miles to the Joshua Het Smith house, which is uh, in the site, which is now where the Helen Hayes Hospital is. Um, the American patriots who had um, had paused, came back, launched cannon fire on the sloop the, and forced it to withdraw, which effectively stranded Andre on shore. So on, Ar Benedict Arnold provided Andre with civilian clothes and a passport with, a, uh, with an assumed name, John Anderson. Um, Andre hid papers in his boot and was headed back to New York, which was, headed, which was um, in the British had control of. And he was stopped by militiamen whom Andre thought were Tories. And he told those militiamen that he was a British officer. But when they revealed that, that they were in, instead the Continental Army soldiers, Andre tried to backtrack, change his story, say he was a Continental officer. Uh, but the militiamen got suspicious and uh, searched him and found the papers in his boot. And then Arnold, uh, then Andre was taken to the headquarters in North Castle in Westchester County, and then later to the Americans headquarters in Tapan, and he was uh, detained at where the 76 house is. And George Washington came and Andre was tried and uh, condemned to death. All of that happens before, well, 
yes, that all of that happens before the event in this play. Uh, two other things that I'd just like to mention, there's a reference to a, a biblical story of the prophet of Moab, and that refer refers to uh, Balaam, who was sent by the Moabite king to curse the Israelites, but the prophet uh, uh, was approached by an angel of the Lord and who persuaded him that the Israelites were good. So when you, when you'll, you'll see that when it comes. The last uh, reference that I wanted to mention is there's a reference to Otway. Otway was a playwright and he wrote a play called Venice Preserved, which was a melodrama from 1682, which was revised, frequent, revived frequently through the 1830s. And it was about uh, Jaffir, a noble Venetian, and Pierre, a foreign soldier who conspired against the senators of Venice. And through much plotting, counterplotting, and backstabbing, Pierre is condemned to die a dishonorable death by hanging rather than the death of a soldier. And, but just as Pierre is about to be hanged, Jaffir rushes up to the gallows, stabs him, and then Jaffir commits suicide. And to top it off, Jaffir's wife goes insane and dies. I don't think that is a play that we will be doing for the public domain players, but I wanted to give you what the plot was. So um, with that, I would like to uh, introduce uh, the cast. I, as I said, I am Derek Tarson. I will be playing the role of Seward, and I will um, call everyone's uh, names, and if you could just uh, uh, come on, introduce yourself and the character you're playing. So let's start with Dan. Hi, I'm Dan. Dan. Hello, I'm Dan Hell, and uh, yes. I'm playing George Washington. All right, uh, Ralph. Hello, I'm uh, Ralph Powers, and I'm playing the part of McDonald. John. Houston. There we go. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I am John Houston, and I will be playing the role of John Andre. Okay. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Hi, I'm Aaron Newcomb, and I'll be playing the role of Bland. Okay. Um, Ari, I think I saw you on, but I'm not sure whether you're ready yet. If you're not, then just stay silent. I'm here. You're here. Okay. I'm, I'm here. My name is Ari Spence, and I'll be playing the part of Melville. Great. Okay. Uh, Arthur. I'm Arthur Chill, and I'm playing a British officer. Okay. Uh, James. Uh, hi, I'm Jim O'Neill, and I'm playing an American officer. Okay. Madeline? Hi, I'm Madeline Clark, and I'm playing the role of first child. Okay, thank you. And Dylan? I'm Dylan Marvin, and I will be playing child two. Okay. Uh, Rich? Hi, everyone. I'm Rich Zero. I am playing the sergeant the servant, and most importantly, I'll be doing the stage directions. Okay. Uh, Kathy? Hi, I'm Kathy DiBiase, and I will be playing Mrs. Bland. And Pauline? I'm Pauline Quinones, and I'm playing Honora. Okay, terrific. All right, and with that, let's get started. Andre, scene one, a wood seen by starlight, an encampment at a distance appearing between the trees. Enter Melville. The solemn hour when night and morning meet, mysterious time to superstition dear, and superstition's guides now passes by, death-like in solitude. The sentinels in drowsy tones from post to post send the signal of the passing hour. All's well sounds throughout the camp. <laughs> Alas, all is not well. Else why stand I, a man, the friend of man, at midnight's depth, decked in this murderous guise, the habiliment of death, the badge of dire necessity coercion? Tis not well. In vain the enlightened friends of suffering point out of war, the folly, the guilt, and madness. Still, age succeeds to age and war to war, 
and man, the murderer, marshals out his hosts in all the gaiety of festive pomp to spread around him death and desolation. How long, how long? Methinks I hear the tread of feet this way. My meditating mood may work me well. Melville draws Stand. his pistol. Stand, whoever so thou art. Answer, who's there? Enter, a friend. A friend. Advance, countersign. Hudson. What? Bland. Melville, my friend, you here? <laughs> and well, my brave young friend. But why do you, at this dead hour of night, approach the camp on foot and thus alone? Dismounted, and from yon sequestered cot whose lonely taper through the crannied wall sheds its faint beams and twinkles midst the trees, have I, adventurous, groped my darksome way, my servant and my horses spent with toil, there wait till morn. Why waited not yourself? Anxious to know the truth of those reports which, from the many mouths of busy fame still, as I passed, struck, varying on my ear, each making the other void, nor does delay the color of my hasteful business suit. I bring dispatches for our great commander, and hasted, and hasted hither with design to wait his rising, or awake him with the sun. You will not need the last, for the blessed sun never rises from his slumber. By the dawn, we see him mounted gaily in the field or find him wrapped in meditation deep, planning the welfare of our war-torn land. Prosper, kind heaven, and recompense his cares. You're from the South, if I presume aright? I am. And, Melville, I am fraught with news. The South teems with events, convulsing ones. The Briton there plays at no mimic war. Gallant face he moves, and gallantly is met. Brave spirits, roused by glory, throng our camp. The hardy hunter, skilled to fell the deer, or start the sluggish bear from covert rude. And not a clown that comes, but from his youth is trained to pour from far the leaden death. To, to climb the steep, to struggle with the stream, to labor firmly under scorching skies, and bear unshrinking winter's roughest blast. This and that heaven-inspired enthusiasm which ever animates the patriot's breast shall far outweigh the lack of discipline. Justice is ours. What shall prevail against her? But as I passed along, many strange tales and monstrous rumors have, have my ears assailed. That Arnold had proved false, but he was taken and hung or, or to be hung? I know not what. Another told that all our army, with their much-loved chiefs, sold and betrayed, were captured. But as I nearer drew at yonder cot, t'was said that Arnold, traitor-like, had fled, and that a Briton, tried and proved a spy, was on this day as such to suffer death. As you drew near, plain truth advanced to meet you. Tis, even as you heard, my brave young friend, never had people in a single throw more interest at stake when he who held for us the die proved false and played us foul, but for a circumstance of the nice kind, of cause so microscopic that the tongues of inattentive men call it in the effect of chance, we must have lost the glorious name. Blessed, blessed be heaven, whatever was the cause. The blow ere this had fallen that would have bruised, the tender plant which we have striven to rear, crushed to the dust no more to bless the soil. What warded off the blow? The brave young man who this day dies was seized within our bounds in the garb disguised. He offered bribes to tempt the fan seized him, but the rough farmer for his country armed, soil defending which his plowshare turned, those laws his father chose and he approved cannot as mercenary soldiers may be bribed to sell the public wheel for gold tis well just heaven oh grant that thus may fall all those who seek to bring this land to woe all those who or by open force or dark and secret machinations 
seek to shake the tree of liberty or stop its growth in any soil where thou hast pleased to plant it. Yet not a heart but and would him for all confirm that he is brave and virtuous, known but till now as the darling child of honor. And how is called this honorable spy? Andre is his name. Andre? I, Major Andre. Andre? Oh no, my friend, you're sure deceived. I'll pawn my life, my ever sacred fame, my general's favor or a soldier's honor, that gallant Andre never yet put on the guise of falsehood. Oh, it cannot be. How might I be deceived? I've heard him. I've seen him, and what I tell, I tell from well-proved knowledge. No second tale bearer who heard the news. Pardon me, Melville. Oh, that well-known name, so linked with circumstances infamous. My friend must pardon me. Thou wilt not blame when I shall tell what cause I have to love him. What, what cause to think him nothing more the pupil of honor stern than sweet humanity? Rememberst thou, when covered o'er with wounds and left upon the field, I fell the prey of Britain to a loathsome prison ship confined. Soon had I sunk, victim of death, a death of aggravated miseries. But by benevolence urged this best of men, this gallant youth, then favored high in power, sought out the pit obscene of foul disease where I and many a suffering soldier lay. And like an angel, Seeking good for man restored us light and partial liberty. Me he marked out his own. He nursed and cured. He loved and made his friend. I lived by him. And in my heart he lived till when exchanged duty and honor called me from my friend. Judge how my heart is tortured, gracious heaven, us. Thus to meet him on the brink of death, a death so infamous. Heaven grant my prayer that I may save him. Oh, inspire my heart with thoughts, my tongue with words that move to pity. Quick, Melville, show me where my Andre lies. Good wishes go with you. I'll save my friend. Exeunt. Scene two. The encampment by starlight. Enter the general, MacDonald, and Seward. Tis well each sentinel upon his post stands firm and meets me at the bayonet point, while in his tent life the weary soldier lies. Sweet reward of wholesome toil, enjoying resting secure as erst within his cot. He's careless slept. His rural labor o'er Britain's dared to violate those laws, those boasted laws by which themselves are governed, and strove to make their fellow subjects slaves. They know to whom they owe their present safety. I hope they know and hope they knew that to themselves they owe it, to the good discipline which they observe, the discipline of men, the order trained, who know its value and whom it is virtue, to that prompt hardihood in which they meet or toil or danger, poverty or death. Mankind who know not whence that spirit springs which holds at bay all Britain's boasted power, gaze on their deeds, astonished. See the youth start from his plow and straight away play the hero. Unmurmuring, bear such toils as veterans shun, rest all content upon the damsome earth, follow undaunted to the deathful charge. Or, when occasion asks, lead to the breach, fearless of all the unusual din of war. His foremost peaceful mates, oh, oh, patriotism, thou womb and wondrous principle of godlike action. Wherever liberty is found, there reigns the love of country. Love of country now, the self-same spirit which filled the breast of great Leonides swells in the hearts of thousands on these plains, thousands who never heard the hero's tale. Tis this alone which saves thee, O oh, my country. 
until that spirit flies. These western shores, no power on earth shall crush thee. Tis wondrous. The men of other climes from this shall see how easy tis to shake oppression off. How all resistless as a union people, and hence from our success, which by my soul I, I feel as much secured as though our foes were now within their foaming prison housed, and their proud prows all pointing to the east. Shall other nations break their galling fetters and reassume the dignity of man? Well, are other nations in that happy state that having broke coercion's iron yoke? They get some bit to order's gentle voice and walk on earth self-ruled? I am much to fear it. As to ourselves, well, in truth, I nothing see in all the wondrous deeds which we perform, but plain effects from causes full as plain. Rises not men forever against oppression? Tis the law of life, he can't avoid it. But when the love of property unites with sense of injuries past and dread of future, is it then wonderful that he should brave a lesser evil to avoid a greater? Mm, Tis hard, quite hard. We may not please ourselves, but our great deeds ascribing to our virtue. <laughs> MacDonald never spares to lash our pride. In truth, I know of not to make you proud. I think there's none within the camp that draws with better will this sword than does MacDonald. I have a home to God. My son is butchered. Hast thou, MacDonald, no nobler motives for thy arms than love of property and thirst of vengeance? Uh, yes, my good Seward. And yet nothing wonders. I love this country for the sake of man. My parents, and I thank them, crossed the seas and made the native of fair natures, made me native of fair nature's world, with room to grow and thrive in. I have thriven, and feel my mind unshackled, free, expanding, grasping with can unbounded mighty thoughts, at which if chance my mother had good dame in Scotia, a revered parent soil given me to see this day, uh, I should have shrunk affrighted. Now I see in this new world a resting spot for man, if he can stand firm in his place while Europe howls around him, and all unsettled is a thought of vice, each nation in its turn threats him with feeble malice. One trial now we prove and I have met it. And met it like a man, my brave MacDonald. I hope so. And I hope my very, my every act has been the offspring of deliberate judgment. Yet feeling seconds, reasons, cool resolves. Oh, I could hate if I did not more pity these bands of mercenary Europeans so wanting in the common sense of nature as without shame to sell themselves for pills, to aid the cause of darkness, murder man without inquiry, murder, and yet call their trade the trade of honor? <laughs> I sold honor. <laughs> yet honor shall accord an act with falsehood. Oh, that proud man should e'er descend to play the tempter's part and lure men to their ruin. Deceit and honor badly pair together. You have too much, much show of reason, yet methinks what you suggest of one whom fickle fortune in her changeling mood hath hurled, unpitying from her topmost height, the lowest misery tastes not of charity. Andre, I mean. I mean him too, sunk by misdeed, not fortune. Fortune and chance. Ah, oh, most convenient words. Man runs a wild career of blind ambition, plunges in vice, takes falsehood for his buoy. And when he feels the waves of ruin over him, curses in good set terms, poor lady fortune. <laughs> his mood is uh, all untaught. Let us leave him. Though he may think that he is bound to rail, he, we are not bound to hear him. Grant you that? 
Oh, freely, freely, you I never rail on. No thanks for that, your courtesy for office. Oh, you slander me. Slander that would not wound. Worthy MacDonald, though it suits full well the virtuous man to frown on all misdeeds, yet ever keep in mind that man is frail. His tide of passion struggling still with reasons driving his unstable bark upon the rocks of error. Should he sink thus shipwrecked, sure it is not virtue's voice that triumphs in his ruin. I must rest. Adieu. Exeunt, General and Seward. Both good and great thou art, first among men, by nature or by early habit, graced with that blessed quality which gives due force to every faculty and keeps the mind in healthful equipoise, oh, ready for action, invaluable temperance, by all to be acquired, yet scarcely known to any. Exit. End of the first act. Act two. Act two. Scene, a prison. Andre, discovered in a pensive posture, sitting at a table, a book by him and candles. His dress neglected, his hair disheveled. He rises and comes forward. Kind heaven, be thanked for that I stand alone in this sad hour of life's brief pilgrimage. Single in misery, no one else involving. In grief, in shame and ruin, tis my comfort. Thou, my thrice honored sire, in peace went down unto the tomb, nor knew to blush, nor knew a pang for me. And thou, revered matron, couldst bless thy child and yield thy breath in peace? No wife shall weep, no child lament my loss. Thus, May I consolation find in what was once my woe. I little thought of joy in not possessing as I erst possessed. Thy love, Honora. Andre's death, perhaps, may cause a cloud pass o'er thy lovely face. The pearly tear may steal from either eye, for thou mayest feel a transient pang, nor wrong a husband's rights. More than a transient pang, O oh, mayest thou never feel. The morn draws nigh to light me to my shame. Frail nature shrinks. And is death then so fearful? I have braved him, fearless, in the field and steeled my breast against his thousand horrors, but his cool, his sure approach requires a fortitude which naught but conscious rectitude can I give. He retires and sits leaning. Enter bland, unperceived by Andre. Is that Andre? Oh, how changed. Alas, where is that martial fire, that generous warmth which glowed his manly countenance throughout and gave to every look, to every act, a tone of high chivalrous animation? Andre, my friend, look up. Who calls me friend? Young Arthur Bland. That name sounds like a friend's. I have inquired for thee, wished much to see thee. I prithee take no note of these fool's tears. My heart was full, and seeing thee. Embracing oh. him. Oh, Andre, I, I have but now arrived from the South, nor heard till now of this. I cannot speak. I is this a place? Oh, thus to find my friend. Still dost thou call me a friend? I, who dared act against my reason, my declared opinion my against my conscience, and a soldier's fame? Oft in the generous heat of glowing youth, Oft have I said how fully I despised all bribery base, all treacherous tricks in war. Rather my blood should bathe these hostile shores and have it said, he died a gallant soldier. Then with my country's gold encourage treason. 
and thereby purchase gratitude and fame. Still mayest thou say it, for thy heart's the same. Still is my heart the Don't same, still may I say it. But now my deeds will rise against my words, and should I dare to talk of honest truth, frank, un disassembling probity and faith, memory would crimson o'er my burning cheek. My actions retrospected choke the tale. Still is my heart the same. But there has passed a day, an hour, which ne'er can be recalled. Unhappy man, thou all my life past pure, marked by benevolence thy every deed. The outspread map which shows the way thou trod, without one devious track or doubtful line, it all avails thee not. If in one hour, one hapless hour, thy feet are led astray, thy happy deeds all blotted from remembrance, canceled the record of thy former good, is it not hard, my friend? Is it not unjust? Not every record cancelled. Oh, there are hearts where virtue's image, when tis once engraved, can never know erasure. Taking his hand. The hour draws nigh, which ends my life's sad story. I should be firm. By heaven, thou shalt not die. Thou dost not sure deserve it. Betrayed, perhaps, condemned without due circumstances, circumstance made known? Thou didst not mean to tempt our officers, betray our yeoman soldiers to destruction. Silence, nay then, was from a duteous wish to serve the cause thou wast in honor bound. Kind is my bland, who to his generous heart still finds excuses for his erring friend. Attentive to hear and judge me. Pleased with the honors daily showered upon me, I glowed with martial heat my name to rise above the vulgar herd who live to die and die to be forgotten. Thus I stood when avarice or ambition Arnold tempted his country, fame, and honor to betray. Linking his name to infamy eternal in co confidence it was to be proposed to plan with him the means which should ensure thy country's downfall. Nothing then I saw but confidential favor in the service. My country's glory and my mounting fame forgot my former purity of thought and heightened honor scruples disregarded. It was thy duty so to serve thy country. Nay, nay, be cautious ever to admit that duty can beget dissimulation. On ground unoccupied by either part, neutral esteemed, I landed and was met, but ere my conference was with Arnold's closed. The day began to dawn. I then was told that till the night I must seek, I must my safety seek in close concealment. Within your posts conveyed, I found myself involved in unthought dangers. Night came. I sought the vessel which had borne me to my, the fatal spot, but she was gone. Retreat that way cut off, again I sought concealment with the traitors of your army. Arnold now granted passes, and I doffed my martial garb and put on cursed disguise. Thus in a peasant's form I passed your posts. And when, as I conceived my danger o'er, was stopped and seized by some returning scouts, so did ambition lead me step by step to treat with traitors and encourage treason, and then, bewildered in the guilty scene, to quit my martial designated, designating badges, deny my name, and sink into the spy. Thou didst no more than was a soldier's duty to serve the part on which he drew his sword. Thou shalt not die for this. Straight will I fly. I surely shall prevail. It is in vain. All has been tried, each friendly argument. All has not yet been tried. The powerful voice of friendship in thy cause has not been heard. My general favors me and loves my father, my gallant father. Would that he were here, but he perhaps now wants an Andre's care to cheer his hours. Perhaps now languishes amidst those horrors whence thou saved, thou savest his son. The present moment claims my thought. Andre, I fly to save thee. Land, it is in vain, 
But hold, there is a service thou mayst do me. Speak it. Oh, think, and as a soldier, think, how I must die, the manner of my death. Like the base ruffian or the midnight thief, ta'en in the act of stealing from the poor, to be turned off the felon's murderer's cart, a mid-air spectacle to gaping clowns, to run a short and envied course of glory, and ended, uh, ended it on a gibbet. Damnation. Such is my doom. Oh, have the manner changed, and of mere death I'll think not. Dost thou think? Perhaps thou canst change that? Thou shalt not die. Let me, oh, let me die a soldier's death, while friendly clouds of smoke shroud from all eyes my last convulsive pangs, and I'm content. Thou shalt not die. Curse on the laws of war, if worth like thine must, must thus be sacrificed to policy so cruel and unjust, I will forswear my country and her service. I'll hide me to the Briton, and with fire and sword and every instrument of death or devastation join in the work of war. What shall, what, shall worth weigh for not? I will avenge thee. Hold, hold, my friend. The country's woes are full. What wouldst thou make, make me cause another traitor? No more of this. And if I die, believe me, thy country for my death incurs no blame. Restrain thy ardor, but ceaselessly entreat that Andre may at least die as he lived, a soldier. By heaven, thou shalt not die. Bland rushes off. Andre looks after him with an expression of love and gratitude, then retires up the stage. Scene closes. Scene, the general's quarters. Enter McDonald and Seward in conversation. 3,000 miles the Atlantic wave rolls on, which bathe Columbia shores, air on the strand of Europe or of Africa, their continents or sea girt isles, it chafes as it flows, trying to be In the midway between those severed worlds rose barriers, all impassable to man, cutting off each course from either side and lost all memory of each other. Well, what spur now goads thy warm imagination? Then might, perhaps, one land on earth be found, free from the extremes of poverty and riches, where ne'er a sceptered tyrant should be known, or tyrant lordling curses of creation, where the faint shrieks of woe, exhausted age, raving in feeble madness, or the corpse of a polluted daughter, stained by lust of thy pampered luxury, might ne'er be heard, where the blasted form of much abused beauty, by villainy seduced, by knowledge all unguarded, might ne'er be viewed, flitting, obscene between lamp and lamp in the midnight street of all defiling city where the child- Hold, hold, shroud thy raven imagination. Torture not me with images so cursed. Soon shall our foes inglorious fly these shores. Peace shall again return. Then Europe's ports shall pour a herd upon us far more fell than those her mercenary sons who now threaten our sore chastisement. Ah, prophet of ill, from Europe shall enriching commerce flow, and many an ill attendant but from thence shall likewise flow blessed science, Europe's knowledge, by sharp experience but we should appropriate, striving thus to keep, to leap from that simplicity with ignorance cursed, to that simplicity by knowledge blessed, unknown the gulf between. <laughs> Mere theoretic dreaming. Blessed wisdom stems from out the chaos of the social world, where good and ill and strange commixture flow to rise by strong necessity impelled, starting like love divine from womb of night, illuming all to order all, Reducing and showing by its bright and noontide blaze that happiness alone proceeds from justice. 
dreams, dreams. Man can not know naught but ill on earth. Yeah. Well, to my bed, where I have watched all night. And may my sleep give pleasing repetition of these my waking dreams. <laughs> Virtues incentives. McDonald exits. Follies shimmer as rather guides to error. Enter Bland, preceded by a sergeant. Packets for the general. Seward, my friend. Captain, I'm glad to see the hue of health sit on a village from the sallow south. The lustihood of youth hath yet defied the parching sun and chilling dew of even. The general, Seward? I'll lead you to him. Seward, I must make bold. Leave us together when occasion offers. Twill be friendly. I will not cross your purpose. Exeunt. Scene, a chamber. Enter Mrs. Bland. Yes, ever be this day a festival in my domestic calendar. This morn will see my husband free. Even now, perhaps, ere yet Aurora flies the eastern hills, shunning the sultry sun, my bland embarks. Already on the Hudson's dancing wave, he chides the sluggish rowers or supplicates for gales propitious that his eager arms may clasp his wife, may bless his little ones. Oh, how the tide of joy makes my heart bound, glowing with high and ardent expectation. Here we Enter. are, Mama. Here we are, Mama, up and dressed already. And why were you so early? Why, did not you tell us that Papa was to be home today? I said, perhaps. Perhaps? I don't like perhapses. No, nor I either, nor maybe so's. We make not certainties, my pretty loves. I do not like perhapses more than you do. Oh, don't say so, Mama, for I'm sure I hardly ever ask you anything, but you answer me with maybe so, perhaps, or very likely, Mama, shall I go to camp tomorrow and see the general? Maybe so, dear. Hang maybe so, say I. Well said, Sir Pertness. But I am sure, Mama, you said that today Papa would have his liberty. So your dear father, by his letters, told me. Why, then I'm sure he'll be here today. When he comes to us, I'm sure he'll stay, he won't stay along with those strange Englishmen and Hessians. I often wish that I had wings to fly, so that I'd soon be with him. <sighs> Dear boy. Enter servant and gives a letter to Mrs. Bland. An express madam from the New York headquarters, in passing, delivered this. Papa's coming home today, John. Exeunt servant and children. What fears oh, assail so. me? Oh, you. I did not oh, want a letter now. My husband, doomed to die, retaliation. To die if Andre dies, he dies today. My husband, to be murdered, and today, today if Andre dies, retaliation. Oh, cursed contrivance, madness, relieve me, burst, burst my brain. Yet, Andre is not dead, my husband lives. One man has power. I fly to save the father of my children. End of the second act. Act three. Scene, the general's quarters. The general and Bland come forward. Captain, you are noted here with honorable praises and upon the countenance for me, which you have proved yourself so richly meriting, both for your father's virtues and your own. Your country owes you honor, the sole return the poor can make for service. If from my country aught I've merited or gained the approbation of her champion at any other time, I should not dare presumptuously to show my sense of it. But now my tongue, all shameless, dares to name the boon 
the precious recompense I wish, which granted pays all service, past or future, overpays the utmost I can ever achieve. Brief, my young friend, briefly your purpose. If I have done my duty as a soldier, if I have braved all dangers for my country, if my brave father has deserved aught, call all to mind and cancel all, but grant my one request, mine and humanities. Be less profuse of words and name your wish. If fit, it fitness is the best assurance that not in vain you sue, but if unjust, thy merits nor the merits of thy race cannot its nature alter, nor my mind from its determined opposition chain. You hold the fate of my most loved of friends. As gallant soldier, as e'er faced a foe, blessed with each polished gift of social life and every virtue of humanity. To me, a savior from the pit of death. To me, and many more my countrymen. Oh, could words betray him what he is, bring to your mind the blessings of his deeds, while throw the fever-heated loathsome holds of floating hulks, dungeons obscene, where near the dewy breeze of morn or evening's coolness breathed on our parching skins, he passed along, diffusing blessings, still his power exerting to alleviate the woes which ruthless war, perhaps through dire necessity, heaped on us. Surely the scene would move you to forget his late intent, though only serving then as duty prompted, and turn the rigor of war's iron law from him, the best of men, meant only for the worst. Captain, no more. If Andre lives, the prisoner finds a friend, else helpless and forlorn, all men will bless the act and bless thee for it. Think thou, thou, my thy country would not curse the man who by a clemency ill-timed, ill-judged, encouraged treason? The pride and courage which by denying us the rights of nations hath caused those ills which thou hast now portrayed. Our prisoners, brave and generous peasantry, as rebels have been treated, not as men. Tis mine, brave yeoman, to assert your rights, tis mine to teach the foe that though arrayed in rude simplicity, yea, yet are men, and rank among the foremost. Off their scouts, the very refuse of the English arms, unquestioned, have our countrymen consigned to death when captured, mocking their agonies. Curse them. Yet let not censure fall on Andre. Oh, there are Englishmen as brave, as good, as ever land on earth might call its own, and gallant Andre is among the best. Since they have hurled war on us, we must show that by the laws of war we will abide, and have the power to bring their acts for trial to the tribunal eminent amongst men, erected by the policy of nations, to stem the flood of ills which else fell war would pour unchecked upon the sickening world sweeping away all traces of civil life. To pardon him would not encourage ill. His case is singular, his station high, his qualities admired, his virtues loved. No more, my good young friend, it is in vain. The men entrusted with thy country's rights have weighed attentive every circumstance. An individual's virtue is by them as highly prized as it can be by thee. I know the virtues of this man and love them. But the destiny of millions, millions yet unborn, depends upon the rigor of this moment. The haughty Britons laughs to scorn our armies and our councils. Mercy, humanity, call loudly that we make our now despised power be felt vindictive. Millions demand the death of this young man. My injured country, he, his forfeit life, must yield to shield thy lacerated breast from torture. Thy merits are not overlooked. Promotions shall immediately attend thee. Pardon me, sir. I shall never deserve it. The country that forgets to, re that, that forgets to reverence virtue, that makes no difference twixt the sordid wretch who for reward seeks treason's penalty, and him unfortunate whose duteous service is by mere accident so changed in form as to assume guilt semblance. I serve not, scorn to serve. I have a soldier's honor, but tis in union with a free man's judgment, and when I act, both prompt. Thus 
from my helm, I tear what once I proudly thought the badge of virtuous fellowship. He tears the cockade from his hat. My sword I keep. Would, Andre, thou hadst never put thine off. Then hadst thou through opposers' hearts made way to liberty or bravely pierced thine own. Exit. Rash, headstrong, maddening boy. It's not this action passed without a witness. Duty would ask that thou shouldst rue thy folly, for the motive be the deed forgotten. Exit. Scene, a village, at a distance some tents. In front, muskets, drums, and other indications of a soldier's quarters. Enter Mrs. Bland and children, attended by Melville. The general's doors are ever open, but why, my worthy friends, this agitation? Our colonel, your husband. Read, Melville. Do not cry, Mama, for I'm sure if Papa said that he would be home today, he will come yet, for he always does what he says he will. He cannot come, dear love. They will not let him. Well, then they told him lies. Oh, fie upon them. Fear nothing, madam, tis an empty threat, a trick of policy. They dare not do it. Oh, alas, alas, what dares not power to do? What art of reasoning or what magic words can still the storm of fears these lines have raised? The wife's and mother's fears? Ye innocents, unconscious on the brink of what a perilous precipice ye stand, Unknowing that today ye are cast down to golf. Oh, poor babes, ye weep from sympathy. Children of sorrow, nursed, nurtured, missed camps and arms. Unknowing man, but as man's fell destroyer, must ye now, to crown your piteous fate, be fatherless? Oh, Lead me, lead me to him, let me kneel, let these my children kneel, till Andre pardoned, enforce to me a husband, them a father. Madam, duty forbids further attendance. I am on guard today, but see your son. To him I leave your guidance. Good wishes, prosper you. Exit Melville, enter Bland. Oh, my Arthur, oh, my Arthur. My mother. He embraces her. My son, I have been wishing for you. But whence this grief, these tears, my mother? Why are these little cheeks bedewed with sorrow? He kisses the children. Brother! 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 Have I done aught to cause a mother's sadness? No, my brave boy. I have oft feared, but never sorrowed for thee. High praise. Then bless me, madam, for I have passed through many a bustling scene since I have seen a father or a mother. Bless thee, my boy. Oh, bless him, bless him to heaven. Render him worthy to support these babes. So soon, perhaps, all fatherless. Dependent. What meanest thou, madam? Why these tears? Thy father. A prisoner of war, I long have known it, but made so without blemish to his honor, and soon exchange returns unto his friends to guard these little ones and point and lead to virtue and to glory. Never, never. His life, a sacrifice to Andres Manes, must soon be offered. Even now, in dungeon, like a vile felon, on the earth he lies, his death expecting. Andre's execution gives signal for the murder of thy father. Andre now dies. My father and my friend? There is but one on earth can save my husband, but one can pardon Andre. Haste, my mother, thou wilt prevail. Take with thee in each hand an unoffending child of him thou weepst. Save, save them both. This way, haste, lean on me. Exeunt. Scene. The general's quarters. Enter the general and MacDonald.
Here I have intimation from the foe that still they deem the spy we have condemned, merrily captive by the laws of arm, from deaths protected and retaliation as they term it, threaten if we our purpose hold. Bland is the victim they have singled out, hoping his threatened deaths will Andre save. Well, if I were bland, I boldly might advise my general how to act. Free and in safety, I will now suppose my counsel needless. Enter an American officer. Another flag hath from the foe arrived and craves admittance. Conducted hither, let us unwearied here unbiased judge what air against our martial court's decision our enemies can bring. Enter a British officer conducted by the American officer. Oh, welcome, sir. What further says Sir Henry? This from him. He calls on you to think what weighty woes you now are busy bringing on your country. He bids me say that if your sentence reach the prisoner's life, prisoner of arms he deems him, and no spy, on him alone it falls not. He bids me loud proclaim it and declare, if this brave officer, by cruel mockery of war's stern law and justice's feigned pretense, be murdered, the sequel of our strife, bloody, unsparing and remorseless, you will make. Think of the many captives in our power. Already one is marked for Andre. And when his death unparalleled in war the signal gives, then Colonel Bland must die. Tis well, sir. Bear this message in return. Sir Henry Clinton knows the laws of arms, and he is a soldier, and I think a brave one. The prisoners he retains, he must account for. Perhaps the reckoning's near. I likewise am a soldier entrusted by my country. But I shall judge most for that country's good. That I shall do. When doubtful, I consult my country's friends, never her enemies. In Andre's case, there are no doubts. Tis clear, Sir Henry Clinton knows it. We consequences. In strict regard to consequence, I act. And much should doubt to call that action right, however specious, whose apparent end was misery to man. That brave officer, whose death you threatened for himself, drew not his sword. His country's wrongs aroused his mind. Her good alone, his aim. And if his fall can further fire that country to resistance, he will with smiles yield up his glorious life and count his death again. And though Colombians will lament his fall, they will lament in blood. Hear this, hear this mankind. Thus am I answered. Enter a sergeant with the letter. Express from Colonel Bland. With your permission. He opens the letter. Your pleasure, sir. It may my mission further. Oh, Bland, my countryman, surely I know thee. Tis short. I will put form aside and read it. Excuse me, my commander, for having a moment doubted your virtue, but you love me. If you waver, let this confirm you, my wife and children to you and my country. Do your duty. <clears throat> Report this to your general. I shall, sir. He bows and exit with the American officer. Oh, Bland, my countrymen. He exits. Triumph of virtue. Like him and thee still be Americans. Then though all powerful Europe league against us and pour in arms her legions on our shores, who is so dull would doubt their shameful flight? Who doubt our safety and our glorious triumph? Scene, the prison, enter bland. Lingering, I come to crush the bud of hope my breath has, flattering to existence warmed. Hard is the task to friendship, hard to say, to the loved object there remains no hope, no consolation for thee. Thou must die, the worst of deaths, no circumstance abated. 
Enter Andre in his uniform and dressed. Is there that state on earth which friendship cannot cheer? Little I bring to cheer thee, Andre. I understand. Tis well, twill soon be past. Yet, twas not much I ask. A soldier's death, a trifling change of form. Of that I, I spoke not. By the vehemence of passion hurried on, I, I pleaded for thy precious life alone. The which denied my indignation barred all further parley. But strong solicitation now is urged to gain the wished for favor. What is the clock? Just past the stroke of nine. Why, then tis almost o'er. But to be hung. Is there no way to escape that infamy? What then is infamy? No matter, no matter. Our general hath received another flag. Soliciting for me? On thy behalf. I have ever been favored. Threatenings now, no more solicitations. Harsh, indeed. The import of the message, harsh indeed. I'm, I'm sorry for it. Would that I were dead, and all was well with those I leave behind. Such a threat. Is it not enough, just heaven, that I must lose this man? Yet there was left one for my soul to rest on. But to know that the same blow deprives them both of life. What means thou, Bland? Surely my general threat threats not retaliation. In vengeance, dooms not some better man to die for me. The best of men. Thou hast a father captive. I, I dare not ask. That father dies for thee. Gracious heaven, how woes are heaped upon me. What? Cannot one so trifling in life's seen fall without daring such a ponderous ruin? Leave me, my friend, a while. I yet have life, a little space of life. Let me exert it to prevent injustice. From death to save thy father, thee to save from utter desolation. What meanst thou, Andre? Seek thou the messenger who brought this threat. I will my last entreaty send by him. My general, sure, will grant it. To the last thyself. Exits. If at this moment, when the pangs of death already touch me, firmly my mind against injustice strives, and the last impulse to my vital powers is given by anxious wishes to redeem my fellow men from pain. Surely my end, however accomplished, is not infamous. Exit. End of the third act. Act four. Scene. The encampment. Enter McDonald and Bland. It doth in truth appear that as a spy, the tested word, brave Andre must be viewed. His sentence he confesses strictly just, yet sure a deed of mercy from thy hand could never lead to ill. By such an act, the stern and blood-stained brow of war would be disarmed of half its gorgon horrors. More humanized customs be induced, and all the race of civilized man be blessed in the example. Be it thy suit, to well become thy character and station. Trust me, young friend, I am alone the judge of what becomes my character and station. And having judged that this young Briton's death, even though attended by thy father's murder, is necessary. And these times are cursed when, when every thought of man is tinged with blood, I will not stir my finger to redeem them. Nay, much I wonder. And much I wonder, Blonde, having so oft the reasons for this necessary rigor enforced upon thee, thou wilt still persist in feign solicitations. Imitate thy father. My father knew not Andre. I know his value. Owe to him my life. And gratitude, that, that first, that best of virtues, without the which man sinks beneath the brute, binds me in ties indissoluble to him. 
that man created virtue binds thy reason. Man owes to man all love when exercised. He does no more than duty. Gratitude, that, that, that selfish rule of action which commands that we, our performance, make of men, not for their worth, but that they did us service. Misleading reason, casting in the way of justice, stumbling box, cannot be virtue. Detested sophistry, t'was Andre saved me. He saved thy life, and thou art grateful for it. How self intrudes delusive on man's thoughts. He saved thy life, yet strove to damn thy country. Doomed millions to the haughty Britain's yoke, the best and foremost in the cause of virtue, to death by sword, by prison, or the halter. His sacrifice now stands the only bar between the wanton cruelties of war and our much suffering soldiers. Yet when weighed with gratitude for that he saved thy life, these things prove gossamer and balance air, perversion monstrous of man's moral sense. Rather perversion monstrous of all good is thy accursed detestable opinion. Cold-blooded reasoners such as thee would blast all warm affection, asunder sever every social tie of humanized man. Cursed be thy sophisms, cunningly contrived, the callous coldness of thy heart to cover, and screen thee from the brave man's detestation. Boy, boy. Thou knowest that Andre's not a spy. I know him one. Thou hast acknowledged it. Thou liest. Shame on thy ruffian tongue. How passion mars thee. Oh, I pity thee. Thou canst not harm by words intemperate a virtuous man. I pity thee, for passion sometimes sways my older frame to reform our unchecked habit. But when I see the havoc which it makes in others, I can shun the snare accursed and nothing feel but pity. Pity me? Thou canst be cool, yet trust me. Passion sways thee. Fear does not warm the blood, yet tis a passion. Hast thou no feeling? I have called thee a liar. If thou couldst make me one, I then might grieve. Thy coldness goes to freezing. Thou art a coward. Thou knowest thou tellest the falsehood. Thou shalt know. None with impunity speaks thus of me, that to rouse thy courage. Glenn touches MacDonald gently, with his open hand crossing to him. MacDonald looks unmoved. Thou do dost thou not yet feel? For thee I feel, and thou another acts cast no dishonor on the worthy man. I still feel for thy father. Yet remember, I may not happily ever be thus guarded. I may not always the distinction make, however just between the blow intended to provoke and the one that's meant to injure. Hast thou no sense of honor? Uh, truly, yes, for I am honor's votary. Honor with me is, is worth, tis, tis truth, tis uh, virtue, tis a thing so high preeminent that a boy's breath or brute's or madman's blow can never reach it. My honor is so much, so truly mine, that none hath power to wound it, save myself. I will proclaim thee through the camp a coward. Uh, think better of it. Proclaim not thine own shame. I'll brand thee. Damnation. Exit. Uh. A man who values fame, oh, passion, passion. A man who values fame far more than life. A brave young man, in many things a good, utters vile falsehood, adds injury to insult. Striving with blood to seal such foul injustice, all from impulse of unbridled feeling. Oh, there comes the mother of his headstrong boy, severely racked. What shall they her torture? The common consolation here is insult. 
Enter Mrs. Bland and children. Oh, my good friend. I know thy cause of sorrow. Art thou now from our commander? I am, but vain is my entreaty. All unmoved, he hears my words. He sees my desperate sorrow. Fain would I blame his conduct, but I cannot. Strictly examined with intent to mark the error which so fatal proves to me, my scrutiny that ends in admiration. Thus, when the prophet from the hills of Moab looked down upon the chosen race of heaven with fell intent to curse, ere yet he spake truth, all resistless emanation bright from great Odoni filled his froward mind and changed the curses of his heart to blessings. Mm, thou payest high praise to virtue. Whither now? I still must hover round this spot until my doom is known. Then to my quarters, lady. There shall my mate give comfort and refreshment. Uh, one of your sex can best your sorrow soothe. Exeunt. Seen the prison. Enter bland. Where'er I look, cold desolation meets me. My father, Andre, and self condemnation. Why seek I Andre now? Am I a man to soothe the sorrows of a suffering friend? The weathercock of passion, full inebriate. Who could with ruffian hand strive to provoke horror wisdom to intemperance? Who could lie? I swagger, lie, and brag. Liar, damnation. Oh, let me steal away and hide my head, nor view a man condemned to harshest death, whose words and actions, when by mine compared, show white as innocence and bright as truth. I now would shun him, but that his shortened thread of life gives me no line to play with. He comes with smiles and all the air of triumph, while I am sinking with remorse and shame. Yet he is doomed to death, and I am free. Enter Andre. Welcome, my bland, cheerly a welcome hither. I feel assurance that my last request will not be slighted. Safely thy father shall return to thee. See what employment for a dying man. Take thou these verses, and after my decease, send them to her, whose name is woven in them, whose image hath controlled my destiny. Such tokens are rather out of date, fashions there are in love as in all else. They change as variously. A gallant knight, ere a while of Cor de Leon's day, would dying send his heart home to his mistress. Degenerate soldier, I send but some blotted paper. If it would not damp thy present cheerfulness, I would require the, the meaning of thy words. I, I never till now did hear of Andre's mistress. Mine is a story of that common kind, so often told with scanty variation, that the palled ear loathes the repeated tale. Each young romancer chooses for his theme the woes of youthful hearts by the cold hand of frosty age armed with parental power, asunder torn. But I long since have ceased to mourn, well satisfied that she I love, happy and holy union with another, shares not my wayward fortunes, nor would I know these tokens send. Remembrance to awaken, but that I know her happy, and that happy can think of a misery and share it not. Someone approaches. Why, tis near the time. But tell me, Bland, say, is, is the manner changed? I hope it, but I yet have no assurance. Well, well. I must see him. Whose voice was that? My senses, do I dream? He leans on Bland. Enter Honora. Where is he? Tis she. He advances towards Honora. She rushes into his arms. 
it is enough. He lives, and I shall save him. She faints in the arms of Andre. She sinks. Assist me, Bland. Oh, save her, save her. They place her in a chair, and Andre looks tenderly on her. Yet, why should she awake from that sweet sleep? Why should she open her eyes? To see me hung! What does she hear? Stand off and let her die. How pale she looks, how worn that tender frame. She has known sorrow. Who would injure her? She revives. Andre, soft, bend forward. Andre kneels and supports her. Andre. Loved excellence. Yes, it is Andre. She rises and looks at him. No more deceived by visionary forms, by him supported. She leans on him. Why is this? Thou dost look pale, Honora, sick and wan, languid thy fainting limbs. All will be well, but was it kind to leave me as thou didst, so rashly to desert thy vow linked wife? When made another's both by vows and laws. What meanest thou? Didn't thou not marry him? Marry? Didst thou not give thy hand away from me? Oh, never, never. Not married? To none but thee, and but in will to thee. Oh, blind, blind wretch, thy father told me. Thou wast deceived. They, they hurried me away, spreading false rumors to remove thy love. Thou didst believe, did too soon believe them. Thy father? How could I but believe Honora's father? And he did tell me so. I reverenced age, yet knew age was not virtue. I believed his snowy locks, and yet they did deceive me. I have destroyed myself and thee, alas, ill-fated maid, why didst thou not forget me? Hast thou rude seas and hostile shores explored for this? To see my death witness my shame? I come to bless thee, Andre, and shall do it. I bear such offers from thy kind commander and must prevail to save thee. Thus the daughter may repair the ills her cruel sire inflicted. My father dying gave me cause to think that arts were used to drive thee from thy home. But what those arts I knew not, an heiress left of years mature with power and liberty. I straight resolved to seek thee o'er the seas, a long, no friend, a, known, a long known friend who came to join her lord yielded protection and loved fellowship. Indeed, when I, I did hear of thy estate, I, it almost killed me. I was weak before. Tis I have murdered thee. Oh, all shall be well. Thy general heard of me and instant formed the plan of this my visit. I am strong compared with what I was. Hope strengthens me. Nay, even solicitude supports me now. And when thou shalt be safe, thou wilt support me. Support thee? Oh, heaven, what? And must I die? Die and, and leave her thus, suffering unprotected. Enter Melville and guard. I am sorry that my duty should require service, at which my heart revolts, but Sir, our soldiers wait in arms. All is prepared. T to death? Impossible! H has my delay then murdered him? A, a momentary respite. Lady, I have no power. Although, my friend, this lady bears dispatches of high import, touching this business. Shall they arrive too late? For pity's sake in heavens, con conduct him to me and, and wait the issue of our conference. Oh, it would be murder of the blackest die. Sin execrable not to break thy orders. Inhuman thou art not. 
lady thou sayest true. For rather would I lose my rank in arms and stand cashiered for lack of discipline than gained amongst military men all praise, wanting the touch of sweet humanity. Thou grantest my request? <sighs> lady, I do. Retire! Soldiers, go out. I know not what excuse to martial men thou canst advance for this, but to thy heart thou wilt need none, good Melville. Oh, Honora. Cheer up. I feel assured hope wings my flight to bring thee tidings of much joy to come. Exit Honora with Bland and Melville. Eternal blessings on thee, matchless woman. If death now comes, he finds the veriest coward that ere hath ere he dealt withal. I cannot think of dying, void of fortitude, each thought clings to the world. The world that holds Honora. Exit. End of the fourth act. Act five. Scene. The encampment. Enter Bland. Suspense, uncertainty, man's bane and solace. How racking now to me. My mother comes. Forgive me, O oh my father, if in this war, this wasting conflict of my wildering passions, memory of thee holds here a second place. When Donald comes with her, I would not meet him. Yet I will do it. Summon up some courage, confess my fault, and gain, if not his love, at least the approbation of my judgment. Enter Mrs. Bland and children with MacDonald. Say, madam, is there no change of counsel or, or new determination? Not new, my son. The tale of misery is told unheard. The widows and the orphans' sighs fly up unnoted by the eye of man and mingle undistinguished with the winds. My friend, attend thy duties, I must away. You need not cry, Mama. The general will do it, I'm sure, for I saw him cry. He turned his head away from you, but I saw it. Oh, poor thing. Come, let us home and weep. Alas, I can no more, for war hath made men rocks. Exeunt, Mrs. Bland and children. Colonel. I used thee ill this morning. Uh, thyself thou used most vilely, I remember. Myself sustained the injury, most true, but the intent of what I said and did was ill to thee alone. I'm sorry for it. Seest thou these, bl these blushes? They proceed from warmth as honest as the heart of man e'er felt, but not with shame unmingled while I force this tongue debased to own it slandered thee, and uttered, I could curse it, uttered falsehood. How error was led by passion, still my mind retains that sense of honest rectitude which makes the memory of an evil deed a troublesome companion. I was wrong. Why, thou disclods me, for thou now art right. Oh, may thy tongue henceforth utter not but truth in sweet precepts, in fair virtue's cause. Give me thy hand. Ne'er may it grasp a sword, but in defense of justice. Yet, erewhile, a few short hours scarce passed when this vile hand attempted on thee insult and was raised against thy honor, ready to be raised against thy life. If this my deep remorse... Ah, no more, no more, tis past. Remember it, but as thou wouldst the action of another. By thy enlightened judgment much condemned, and serving as a beacon in the storms, thy passions yet may raise. Remorse is vice. Guard thee against its influence to basin. Say to thyself, I am not what I was. I am not now the instrument of vice. I'm changed. I am a man. Virtue's firm friend. So ever, forever from my former self. Also link, but in remembrance salutary. Noble MacDonald, truth and honor's champion, 
Yet think not strange that my intemperance wrong thee, good as thou art, for wouldst thou, canst thou think it? My tongue unbridled hath the same offense with action violence and boisterous tone hurled on that glorious man whose pious labors shield from every ill his grateful country, that man whom friends to adoration love and enemies revere. Yes, Madonna, even in the presence of the first of men did I abjure the service of my country and reft my helmet of that glorious badge which graces even the brow of Washington. How shall I see him more? Alive himself to every generous impulse. He hath excused the impetuous warmth of, thy, of youth in expectation that thy fiery soul, chastened by time and reason, will receive the stamp indelible of godlike virtues. To me, in trust, he gave this badge disclaimed with power when thou should see thy wrongful error. From him to reinstate it in thy helm and thee in his high favor. McDonald gives the cockade to Bland, who takes the cockade and replaces it. Shall I speak my thoughts of thee? Shall I speak my thoughts of thee and him? No. Let my actions henceforth show what thou and he have made me. Ne'er shall my helmet lack again its proudest, noblest ornament, until my country knows the rest of peace, or Bland the peace of death. Exeunt. Scene, the general's quarters. Enter general and seward. Ask her, my friend, to send by thee her paquettes. Exit seward. Oh, what keen struggles must I undergo? On blessed estate to have the power to pardon, the court's stern sentence to remit, give life. Feel the strong wish to use such blessed power, yet know that circumstances strong as fate forbid to obey the impulse. Oh, I feel that man should never shed the blood of man. Enter Seward. Naught can the lovely suitor, suitor, suitor satisfy but conference with thee, and much I fear refusal would cause madness. Yet to admit, to hear, by tortured, and ref refuse at last. There never man such spectacle of sorrow saw before. Motionless, the rough-hewn soldiers silently view her, or walk aside and weep. Admit her. Seward goes out. Oh, for the art, the precious art, to reconcile the sufferer to his sorrows. Honora rushes in and throws herself wildly on her knees before the general. He endeavors to raise her. Nay, nay, here is my place, or here or lower. Unless thou grantest his life, all forms away. Thus will I clasp thy knees, thus cling to thee. I am his wife, as I am. Ruined him. Oh, oh, save him. Give him to me. Let us cross the mighty seas far, far, never to offend again. The general turns away and hides his eyes with his hand. Enter Seward and an officer. Seward, support her. My heart is torn in twain. Honora, as if exhausted, suffers herself to be raised and leans on Seward. This moment, sir, a messenger arrived with well-confirmed and mournful information that gallant Hastings, by the lawless scouts of Britain taken after cruel mockery, which showed of trial and condemnation on the next tree was hung. Oh, oh, it is false! Why, why, my country, did I hesitate? He exits. Honora sinks, faints, and is borne off by Seward and an officer. Scene, the prison. Andre meeting Bland. How speeds Honora? Art thou silent, Bland? Why, then I know my task. The mind of man, if not by vice debased, debilitated, or by disease of body quite untoned, hath o'er its thoughts a power, energy divine, a fortitude the source and every virtue. 
a godlike power which in or circumstances its sovereignty exerts now from my thoughts honora yet she is left alone exposed oh andre spurn me strike me to the earth for what a wretch am i in andre's mind that he can fit that he can think he leaves his love alone and I retaining life. Forgive me, Bland. My thoughts glanced not on thee. Imagination pictured only then her orphan state helpless. Her weak and grief exhausted frame, alas, this blow will kill her. Here do I myself devote my fortune consecrate to thee, to thy remembrance. In Honora's service. Enough. Let me not see her more, nor think of her. Farewell. Farewell, sweet image. Now for death. Yet that you shouldst the felon's fate fulfill. Damnation, my blood boils. Indignation makes the current of my life course wildly through its round and maddens each emotion. Come, come, it matters not. I do remember when a boy at school in our allotted tasks, we by our own, by our puny acts, strove to portray the giant thoughts of Otway. I was Pierre. Oh, thou art Pierre's reality, a soldier on whose manly brow sits fortitude enamored, a Mars abhorring vice yet doomed to die a death of infamy. Thy course exposed to vulgar gaze, halter distorted, oh. Pierre had a friend to save him from such a shame. And so hast thou. No more, as thou dost love me. I have a sword and arm that never failed me. Bland, such an act would justly thee involve and leave that helpless one thou sworest to guard exposed to every ill. Oh, think not of it. If thou wilt not my aid, take it thyself. He draws no. and offers his sword. No, men will say that cowardice did urge me. In my mind's weakness, I did wish to shun that mode of death which e'er represented infamous. Now, let me rise superior, and with a fortitude too true to start from mere appearances, Show your country that she, in me, destroys a man who might have lived to virtue. Bland sheathes his sword. I would not think more of it. I was again the sport of erring passion. Go thou, and guide Honora from this spot. Enter Honora. Who shall oppose his wife? I will have my way. They cruel would have kept me from thee, Andre. Say I am not thy wife. Wilt thou deny me? Indeed, I am not dressed in bridal trim, but I have traveled far. Rough was the road, rugged and rough. That must excuse my dress. Thou, thou art not glad to see me? Break my heart. Indeed, I, I feel not much in spirits. I, I wept, but now. Enter Melville and guard. Say nothing. I am ready. Are, are they here? Here again? The same? But, but they shall not harm me. I am with thee, my Andre, I am safe, and thou art safe with me, is it not so? Enter Mrs. Bland. Where is this lovely victim? Oh, thanks, mother. MacDonald sent me hither. My woes are past. Thy father, by the foe released, already is in safety. This be forgotten now, and every thought be turned to this sad scene. Come, lady, home with me. Go, go home with thee? Art thou my Andre's mother? Will we home and rest for 
thou art weary, very, very weary. She leans on Mrs. Bland. Andre retires to the guard and goes off with them, looking on her to the last and with an action of extreme tenderness takes leave of her. Melville and Bland accompany him. Now we will go. Come, love. Where, where is he? All gone. I do remember. I awake. Oh, they have him. Murder. Help. Oh, save him. Save him. Honora attempts to follow but falls. Mrs. Bland kneels to assist her. Scene closes. Scene. The encampment. Procession to the execution of Andre. First enter pioneers, detachment of infantry, military band of music, infantry, the music having passed off, enter Andre between Melville and an American officer. They sorrowful, he cheerfully converses as he passes over the stage. It may in me be merely prejudice, the effect of young opinion deep engraved upon the tender mind by care parental. But I must think your country has mistook her interests. Believe me, but for this I should not willingly have drawn a sword against her. They bow their heads in silence. Opinion must, nay ought, to sway our actions. Therefore, having crossed the stage, he goes out still conversing with them. Another detachment of infantry with muffled and craped drums closes the procession. As soon as they are off, the scene draws and discovers the distant view of the encampment. Procession enters in the same order as before, proceeds up the stage and goes off on the opposite side. Enter MacDonald, leading Bland, who looks wildly back. I dare not thee resist, yet why, oh why, thus hurry me away? Wouldst thou behold what thou saw hast oh, so long? Oh, name it not. Oh, wouldst thou by thy looks and gestures while overthrow that manly calmness, which, or assumed, or felt, so well becomes thy friend? What means that canon sound? Signal of death. Appointed. Andre, thy friend, is no more. Farewell. Farewell, brave spirit. Oh, let my countrymen henceforward, when the cruelties of war arise in their remembrance, when their ready speech would pour forth torrents in their foes' dispraise, think on this act accursed and lock complaint in silence. Bland throws himself on the earth. Such are the dictates of the hair, not hate. Oh, may the children of Columbia still be taught by every teacher of mankind each circumstance of calculative gain or wounded pride which prompted our oppressors. May every child be taught to lisp the tale, and may, in times to come, no foreign force, no European influence, tempt to misstate or awe the tongue of eloquence to silence. Still may our children's children deep abhor the motives, doubly deep detest the actors, ever remembering that the race who planned, who acquiesced or did the deeds abhorred has passed from off the earth. And in its stead stand men who challenge love or detestation, but from their proper individual deeds. Never let the memory of the sire's offense descend upon the sun. Curtain drops, end of play.
Right, wonderful. Very good, everyone. So, thank you all. I, um, we are going to have a, a short uh, question and answer this time. If you can all uh, turn on your, um, your, your cameras. And um, I will, I, actually, while we're waiting for that, and if anyone wants to leave at this time, that's, that's totally fine. Um, I, I will mention one uh, interesting historical fact about this play, that um, on the first night of this play, uh, the audience practically rioted because the, when Bland took off his cockade and hurled it at General Washington, that was deemed to be such an unpatriotic act. And originally in the play, this, that second scene that Bland has with McDonald, where he apologizes for it and, and puts the cockade back on, that was not in the play. But that was added because the audience had such a strong reaction. So um, let me just ask uh, Mary there Cardenas. I oh, there, there, I yes. see you're there. Yes, why don't you, why don't you turn I on your camera? I will try to do that. Okay, great. And, uh, yeah, and I'm not sure how successful. Okay, well, we'll we can go without it. That's fine. It'd be too bad, but but um, all right. So um, I I do see someone raising her hands. It says Patricia's iPad. That's is me. that you? Yes. yes. Okay. You. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, right. th what a fantastic gem this is that you've uh, retrieved. Thank you for doing this. Um, what's especially intriguing for me is that's only eighteen years from the actual events. So the languaging is very true to the time period. Uh, there was a couple of phrases. One was uh, the children of Columbia, if anyone can explain to me what that meant. And also I have some confusion. I thought uh, Major Andre had a love interest in Peggy Shippen. And so uh, apparently he married Honora. Is that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not up on okay. my history there. No, that, that's fine. Let me, let, me, let me address both of those. Um, so, so the children of Columbia, that, there, there are several terms that are just very poetic. Um, so Columbia be, means, means the colonies, means, means America. It's as, as though the, the, the land of Columbus is basically- Oh, got it. Okay. Is, is the eye. The, the, this, is, this is certainly before Columbia was a country in South America. So. Okay. Um, and then um, as, to, as to Honora Sneed, um, historically, uh, Andre had courted Honora Sneed, and I do not know about uh, Peggy Shipman. So that you, you could give me information about that. Um, but Honora never came to the to America. That was that was added by, as a, a dramatic touch by the by the playwright. Okay. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, you had another question? Oh, uh, no, just uh, Peggy Shippen was from Philadelphia. Uh, Major Andre was stationed in Philadelphia when the British held Philadelphia, and they retreated, and in came Benedict Arnold. And then uh, uh, Major Andre was known to be uh, younger and handsome and dashing, and, you know, there was a little, uh, you know, Peggy Shipton's family was very pro- the colonists, uh, uh, the colonies, being a colony of England. And then when Benedict Arnold came in to hold Philadelphia, Peggy Shipton seemed to have an affection for Benedict Arnold and connected the two. She was the link between Andre and Benedict Arnold. She introduced them, more or less. And so there was a, and uh, Peggy Shipton did eventually run off with Benedict Arnold to England and they married. And um, it seemed like quite a leap that the young, beautiful, wealthy Peggy Shippen, who was taken with Major Andre, went to Benedict Arnold. I have a lot of curiosity about that whole relationship, if she was kind of using Benedict Arnold and, because Andre was, Hun, she got stuck with him because they got caught. Uh, you know, that's like a whole nother play right. in there. So Honora was in England and he was betrothed to her, but they never married or they did marry. 
I'm not even sure that they were betrothed. I think that they may they may simply have courted one another. Okay, so yeah, I'm, so I'm wondering if Andre, you know, had a girl in every port or whatever was <laughs> going possible. on there. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, <laughs> certainly possible. Uh, Mary, can 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 you uh, shed any light on on uh, on Peggy Shippen and, and, and well, Andre? I'd like to go back to England, uh, where uh, John Andre was engaged to Hinora. Neither his family nor her family approved of the engagement. And later, um, at a party, she meets her husband. Uh, I think his name was Edgeworth, and she eventually marries him. Uh, when John Andre was stationed in Philadelphia with the British, he was involved with the theater and entertainment and, and uh, uh, courted some of the ladies, one of which was Peggy Shippen, whose father or whose family were Tories, pro-British. Uh, he created a play and she was probably starred in it, but I think he was more interested in the military so when she meets uh, Benedict Arnold, who, by the way, was about 19 years her senior, she's taken with this very tall, and he was tall for the time, he was about five foot nine, his dark hair and very blue eyes, very handsome, but he's a very brave soldier. Uh, she is taken with his, I'll say, prowess. So I hope that sheds some light on, on the query. That's great. Okay, let me let me see. Does anyone else have any other questions? If you can just, uh, I we don't have the raise hand feature in this particular Zoom, so just actually raise your hand on camera, and I will hopefully see you. I've got several screens to go through. So. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Why was it that Arnold was exiled, but Andre was executed? Well, I'd like to answer that. Um, Andre was executed. I, there was a, a, a group of British uh, soldiers who came and asked for Andre's release from uh, the Ameri uh, the Continentals. Um, the Continentals were willing to release Andre if they would return. Andre. <coughs> Once you deal with the devil, it's just you, you can't go back on your word. So uh, Andre was kind of left with dealing with his faith. Meanwhile, Benedict Arnold um, went off with the British and he served at, again as a very uh, brave soldier, Battle of, York, uh, of Yorktown, um, but he couldn't go back to the, uh, to the Continentals. So when the war was over, he and his family were sent up to Canada and they lived there for a number of years. And then they went to uh, London where they settled. And that's where he died in 1801, I believe. And I think Peggy Shippen died about three, maybe four years later. Okay. I actually had a question and um, the, the, it, I couldn't find an answer in the sources that I was looking at. But the, the story is that, that um, Andre was stranded because the, the vulture, the sloop the vulture, had been fired on and had to retreat. Um, and yet the next thing we hear is that he's captured in Tarrytown. And I was wondering, how did he get across the river? Well, he was uh, ferried across the river. He went with Joshua Head Smith. And they stayed at a number of places. And I think Joshua Head Smith had left him at, at one point and he got directions which way to go. Uh, he, uh, Andre got uh, directions on heading south. So as he was approaching south or towards uh, British lines, which were held, uh, the headquarters was New York, uh, he was captured just slightly outside of Tarrytown by what we call Skinners. Now, Skinner is a fellow who rustles cattle for the Continentals or the American forces. So that's where he was captured. But again, going back to your question, he was ferried across uh, the Hudson River and then head, headed south towards New York. Great. Okay. All right. Hey. Yes, go ahead, Constance. Go oh, ahead. yes, Derek. Um, it's very interesting to me uh, to watch this and thank you for the performance. I'm over here in Westchester and the group that I'm part of, a nonprofit is called Revolutionary Westchester 
250, you probably know there's this 250th anniversary in 2026. Yeah. But more to the point of your play today and some of Mary's comments, um, the folks in Terrytown um, are very um, adamant about explaining the patriots, the three patriots who captured Andre as being absolutely militiamen who were told uh, to look for the cattle. It wasn't as though they were um, uh, ragamuffins um, or, and there's, there's a lot of interesting research that uh, has been done that we're doing and it's rw250.org. And those of you who are really fascinated by this story, we have uh, that ch this chapter of history. We have about 20 people now who want to follow it and work on commemorative activities. rw250.org. I'll put it in the chat. OK, great. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, uh, Raymond, go ahead and un unmute yourself. All right, <laughs> you're having some technical difficulties. We'll, we'll go on. If you, if you can unmute yourself, go ahead and, and do so. Uh, anyone else? I have a comment. Sure. Uh, regarding the treason house, um, it had long been thought that the treason house had been the, uh, where Helen Hayes Hospital is now. But about 20 years ago, uh, Richard Koch, who was an avid Revolutionary War historian, did a lot of research on it because there was a question as to which Smith house up there on the ridge hilltop was the treason house. There were two of them. And he determined that the true treason house was the one to the south that's up on the ridge behind Hoyer's ice cream. So I just wanted to call your attention to that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm getting my information from Wikipedia, which is not, not, not always the most reliable. So. Oh, there we go. All right. Let's see if uh, anyone else. Why don't, you, why don't you just speak up if you can. Okay. Well, well, terrific. Thank you all for, for uh, uh, coming and um, thank you for all the compliments in the chat. That's really, that's really great. Um, huh. Okay. So um, I guess that's it and have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. It was Thanks terrific. Thanks.